I was living by myself. Like I was just, I was really, really lonely. I felt empty. I don't want to get too much. <laughs> it was always, yeah. Jade Spooner, Forbes 30 Under 30, an eight-figure entrepreneur and partnering with big brands as a strategic advisor, helping them grow their businesses. But in terms of the growth, we were awarded Deloitte's fastest growing technology companies for two years in a row. And the stat that they had was 987% revenue growth, and that was between 12-month period. <laughs> if you've got problems in your business, I guarantee 90% of those problems in your business will be resolved by getting your top five customers in one room and just having a chat. Getting some feed. Yep. How did you initially acquire customers from the very beginning? How did you start to build a customer base? The first customers that we got is actually a thing that I tell a lot of my clients these days is just... If you're interested in growing well through townhouse development, check out the Little Fish Network. You get coaching, expert access, and community support. It's essentially everything you need to win a property and development. Welcome back to Australia's number one podcast. We are Little Fish and we speak to the big fish about town each and every week. Remember, for every subscribe, follow and review in 2024, we're donating a dollar to our amazing charity, Epidemolis Belosa. EB. Getting good at that, Benny. The worst disease you've never heard of. And of course, if you want to make a bigger splash, littlefishpodcast.com.au. Big pink donate button. Can't miss it. Jade, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. In my old stomping ground, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. funny that, isn't it? It's yeah. a great spot. It's a great spot. Yeah. So I was very close to here. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Love it. How's your uh, How's your day been? Busy? Yeah, day's been busy. Days are always busy these days. You said yeah. you're off shooting some content? Yeah, shooting some some content. A mate of mine is sort of coming together and um, doing a, a bit of a startup course for those that want to, you know, start, grow, scale type thing. So we're just shooting a bit of content for that and um, it's keeping me busy. It's, it's like another little side hustle. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I can't have enough Enough of those. side yeah. hustles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jade, so where do we where do we start this? Like you had the you know the nine to five job. Yeah, at Google I did. sounds mm-hmm. like a nice mundane place to start. It was it was a great place to start, a very inspiring place to start. But um, I was working at Google along with my co-founder. She actually got me the job there. Um, this is going back maybe twenty fourteen. So I was a ripe age of twenty two at the time, um, and sort of I actually deferred a law degree to take the Google job because I thought. At worst, like I'll be climbing some, you know, big corporate ladder and I can always return to law, but I ended up um, deferring that, uh, heading to Google and and taking that job. And I think we were there for about nine months before uh, starting Equolution on the side and it just, you know, pulling the heartstrings and just, you know, uh, driving us to end up. We quit that job there and took a one-way ticket to Silicon Valley. So you started that? Whilst you were, yeah, you know, whilst yep. you were at Google. So the background of that is um, I was actually a fitness model in another lifetime, um, as was my co-founder, and we were subject to the, the stereotypical bodybuilding diets of that time. So it was like your chicken, broccoli, fish, asparagus, and really not much else, right? Brucey's diet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so at that time, we, we just sort of put our heads together. And said, There's got to be another way. And to be fair, we stepped on stage after doing one of those diets and we didn't, we were not sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger, like super ripped or anything like that. So we thought there must be another way. And that's when we started looking for answers. So we found a master nutritionist who really changed our lives and our whole perspective and education on nutrition. And he sort of taught us calories in, calories out. And sort of lo and behold, he didn't really like writing meal plans. We had a bit of a knack for it. We sort of, we used to call it sort of like nutrition Tetris. It was about fitting in what you love in a way that satisfied those numbers. So he, he would sort of come up with the numbers, we'd write the plans and then the three of us joined together and formed Equolution. And then we were sort of just doing it as a bit of a side hustle while we're at, at Google. And then we, we knocked on his door and said, like, we want to do this full time. We're obsessed. And he said, oh, I don't. I couldn't think of anything worse. <laughs> you guys take it. You take it. And he his dream was to open a supplement store. And he did. He ended up um, opening – actually, one in, in Maroubra and um, – one in Carrying Bar as well in the Shire um, called Booty and Buff. So oh. he went and started that and we took the the ropes with the business and we had a dream to, it was a service-based business at the time. So we'd be doing personalized plans according to each individual's calorie and macro requirements. And then um, we had a dream to create it into a mobile app. So that's where we took the plunge and quit Google and, and went over to Silicon. And we had sort of like three goals there. We either wanted to find a CTO, 
find an investor or just learn how to build an app because we had it's not it wasn't quite as accessible as like what it is now you know you find a development company there's mm. some reviews and th- it just wasn't like that back in the day so we took a plunge at silicon so you knew that's was that was where you had to go and that's where we had to go quit your jobs and mm-hmm. go over there with with a budget with some money with mm. some, no budget which was the problem <laughs> we just went with savings and we ended up running out of money and having to come home <laughs> but it wasn't a bad thing because you know, we were there for like sort of four months. We observed the market. We really thought we could crack the American market. We're like, we'll go over and launch there. But then we really realized our consumer and that they weren't over there. They were here and we knew them the best. We knew the Australian food culture the best. We knew the groceries the best. You know, we just had to come back here and do what we knew best, which was to service people. And and basically through servicing manually, we were able to save enough money to bootstrap to, to develop the app. And how did you uh, initially acquire customers from the very beginning? Because I, I say it a lot, you know, build it and they will come. It's not quite yep. that easy. So mm-hmm. you've come up with the idea, you've uh, been able to execute the app, mm-hmm. or maybe you haven't at this point, your initial customers, obviously. Yep. Like, yeah, how did you start to build a, a customer base? The first customers that we got, which is actually a, a thing that I tell a lot of my clients these days, is just put it in anyone's hand and do it for free. You know, that I think that's the best the best way to put it. Our first customers were friends and family. So just, it, we were lucky it was weight loss. So if you dangle that carrot in front of people that said anyone will grab it, you know. So we just sort of said anyone that's looking to lose weight, you know, we've got a solution, try it, try it for free. And we were service-based. So our, our cost to service was only time. So we um, didn't really have all that much to lose. So we, we serviced a lot of people for free at the beginning. And then people started paying once people started getting results. Yeah. And we used those testimonials and we were from the get go. We, from a branding perspective, we were so customer centric. So we weren't two influencers who had great bodies and were selling booty plans off the back of it. We were two people that were build, building a customer centric brand. So everything that we did, if we serviced one customer, their story would be told in our marketing. And we, we grew pretty quickly with that. So that was the secret. The it, secret was to give it, get it out to free, yep. prove the concept, take, get the testimonials and yep. use those to their market and drive. And that really refined our service as well. Absolutely. Like for example, when we first started, we used to service like for instance, numbers only. So if you want to find out how much you should eat, so in terms of overall calories, protein, fats and carbs, numbers only. We used to do numbers and meal plan. So learn your intake requirements if you wanted to self-track and then you can get a meal plan as well. And then meal plan only. And slowly but surely we kind of found people wanted the the balance of both. So we scrapped the other two and we just did the one in, in time. So servicing people, gives you that benefit too of being able to really listen as opposed to just act on your founder intuition which isn't always right and yeah you can sort of listen to the customers and drive your decision making that way was it was it a one-off purchase that you were aiming for or was it to get a subscription based model and and keep keep your customer base so i think at the beginning it was all about just making that one sale like mind you we're, we're 23 at this point 22 23 so we're just like just get them in and then we slowly but surely realized people wanted to stay so it then became a matter of making their experience the best which is where the application came into you know, into, into fruition because not only did it reduce our time to service, but it also was just a way better customer experience instead of, you know, sending your measurement card, which was taking a photo of a piece of paper and sending it on a Facebook chat and chatting to us on the Facebook messenger, all that kind of stuff. It was everything streamlined in one place. So it allowed us to, to service people um, better and it meant that they could stay longer too because we could make it cheaper. Is that How important was that to get them in there and get them staying in there, I suppose, because... Because we're building a community, we're building the network and, and we sort of talk about, you know, the people, this needs to be their go-to when they open their phone, they're diving into it each You've time. You've got to find so a reason to get them in there and keep them, not just get them in there, but keep them coming back. That's sort of muscle memory for them to dive into your app and become part of their daily routine. Yeah, well, I think in terms of this space being health, fitness, you know, nutrition, etc. I think you've got a lot of opportunities to be top of mind when it comes to your customer. You know, they wake up, they make the bref- breakfast that you've put on their plan. Mm. They pack their work lunch, which is the plan that you've created for them. They take a photo of it and share it to their followers and it's your business again. So there's, I think it's sort of thinking about the customer journey in regards to like mapping out what the touch points are in someone's one day-to-day and two life cycle with you to sort of see where you can slot in just that little bit more. So it's all for us when we were creating the mobile app, it was all about being sticky. It was just like how how can we give the best experience that this is like 
cool to be inside this app, you know? And that was um, a lot of it in time came down to the UI UX as well. So, you know, the look and feel at the beginning, it was all about sort of functionality. It just needed to bloody work because we mm -hmm. failed twice before we built the third app. Um, we sort of put some money into some uni students when we were younger and then offshore development and then the third one was the lucky one and that was a, a group down at Wollongong called Devika actually and they, they got it right. But at the beginning it was just about this thing is based on algorithms and things. It just yeah. needs to work. And then it was about the experience sort of you know, in amongst that. So when you say service-based, so do you put in all your details and then the algorithm then figures out yeah. macros, calves, all that sort of stuff? Correct. That, yeah. So that's what the app does. But back in the day, the stepping stone to the app was we did that all manually yeah. as a coach, we basically yeah, a coach. Yeah. So yeah, so that's how it's kind of evolved. So you were limited by time as well, right? Yeah, there so, was a ceiling. We worked yeah. that out really young. Like we that's were, cool. I'm, I remember, you know, when we first started the business thinking for X amount of clients, we'd need X coaches. What does that look like <laughs> as, as we grow and grow? And I think the, the highest staff count we got up to was 30. Yeah. And then- that's when we started reducing our, our cost and time to service. Yeah, yeah. And that's when you built the algorithm. And so well, the algorithm also got better. Over, everything got better over time. The more feedback we got, even the database. So users could submit. Um, even technology as well, Definitely. Right? So much better. We even made a movement during our development, which was essentially like we kind of moved everything into a mansion whereas it was in a one bedroom unit before that's kind of like in technology terms like what kind of happened yeah. so there was a lot that did develop over time but even in terms of the database like that was the biggest nightmare of the entire development process and we you know had customers that would submit um, data and then we'd review it and then we'd put it into like a verified database sort of thing so everything got better over time everything does in business I feel like everything does get better in time you keep sort of rocking up yeah at what point like how fast was was the growth, I suppose? Um, well. Was it a grind or was it, no. did it surprise you? It, it was an amazing business from day dot. And even now I'm a business consultant. And since I've left, I've worked with into a hundred businesses and I've never seen anything like Equolution. So I, I do stand by the fact that it just had, it had the DNA to be a fantastic business. T timing as well, would yeah, you say? Yeah, definitely timing because it's so competitive these days. I was about to say, it's a massive space, massive, massive market. Massive, yeah. But, but back but, in the day... We, but it's, you know, there's a few out there as well. Definitely, but we, I felt, you know, you, we didn't really look left or right at competitors all that much. But I just felt like we were first. We were first to do this. We were first to do that. I just felt like... We, you weren't following anyone. We you're, you're just making it up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. But in terms of the growth, like we were awarded Deloitte's fastest growing technology companies for two years in a row. And the stat that they had on the board on the awards night was 987% revenue growth. And that was between 12 month period. So that's how much the app changed everything that we did. Yeah. It was massive. Can I huge. ask, because uh, mm. we, we spoke about the technology and obviously it took three times to get it right and whatever, but um, the branding. So how important would you say, was the, was branding important early or is that something that you guys figured out later or how, and if it was important early, how important? Well, I look at kind of like our logo, for example, just branding in its most simple form, logo, look and feel. Mm. It was shit. <laughs> it was so <laughs> ugly. I think my co-founder made it on something, you know, back in the day. So that was that was a really early branding. But I think if you go to that deeper level of branding, it's like, it's how does this business make people feel? And the truth of the matter is, and because it was weight loss, we were changing people's lives and yeah. people were owing everything to not only the result that they were getting, but the way they were getting it. So we were around and operating in a time where clean eaters were going to town on us. They were like, you know, that's process, that's this, that's that. But we were giving people their livelihood back through nutrition, whereas they'd cut eliminated things before. And we were saying, you know, you can have that in moderation. Yeah. And that was music to a lot of people's ears. So in terms of the branding piece, our customers were the hero for creating that branding effort for us. And it was really done through how so the, the business, stories. It was how, it was yeah, all the, storytelling so, all the storytelling. And the transformations. transformations. It's actually like the, the, the perfect business, a, a weight loss business. Yeah. That's why. And we yeah, were, because you get that full transformation that sells. You've seen so many different people try and do it though. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like they, they haven't got the... The sustainability your business has. Yeah, and I think too, um, 
look, in all due respect to a lot of people in this in this industry, I think the money gets in the way and it does look like a cash grab. Whereas mm. for us, like, like, dude, we were leaving at home. We didn't really care what our revenue weekly was. Like we were just doing a job, you know, a job that we were so passionate about and we were just, it was just about getting the job done. And I think that makes a huge difference. Like, you know, there was no KPIs. There was no must sell this. It was just like, we're obsessed. We were so, we were so obsessed with what we were doing and it changed our lives. So my co-founder and I, um, together we'd lost 50 kilos. She lost 30, I lost 20. It changed everything about our lives and we just wanted to spread the word. It almost felt like it, it, it wasn't even a job. It just felt like a duty, <laughs> you know, so, duty of care. So, yeah, that's amazing. Like, so you guys are war- walking, talking testimonials, <laughs> Yeah. Um, which I read that in the research, which, which was amazing. So when did that take place? Is it when you guys left? You know, when did you guys go on that 20 and 30K so mission? So my co-founder was... Keg. <laughs> the kegs, the kegs. Kegs, not kegs. <laughs> kegs, kegs, Dirty kegs. whatever. <laughs> um, so my co-founder lost the bulk majority of her weight unhealthily pre-equolution. And then she went on kind of like a skinny to fit transformation once she started hitting her protein, eating sufficient calories. Gotcha. She was severely underweight when we started the business. Yeah, okay. And I... I, I was carrying all the weight that she lost, basically. <laughs> and so I lost a lot of my weight through flexible dieting. Yep. But I'd lost a little bit before and then regained it through unhealthily bodybuilding. Yep. So in my off-season, I put on the 10 kilos that I lost to step on stage, basically. Gotcha. And that was through clean eating. And I, I, yeah. not a calorie-controlled diet. It was just, is it good or is it bad, yes or no? And it had no method or yep. logic about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. I think it's good when you can, you know, where, like, just be, I guess, an expert in mm-hmm. the field and, and you guys actually, you know, like you said, not exactly practicing what you preach all the time, but having yep. an understanding about even the ups and downs and losing it in an unhealthy manner. What does that yep. look like? Just, you know, it sounds like you guys are really relatable to your audience. Potentially. Yeah, because you are the customer. So you mm. get them. And I think there's nothing stronger when you're building a business to fully understand who you're servicing on the other side. I even say to a lot of my clients, if you've got problems in your business, I guarantee 90% of those those business those problems in your business will be resolved by getting your top five customers in one room and just having a chat. You know, literally just getting to know the customer through and through. I'm massive on that. Yeah. Yeah. Getting some feedback. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Can I just ask a question about, because um, Brucey asked about the subscription. So you guys were selling manually early, then it went to uh, pres- uh, subscription. Yeah. Was there an opportunity to uh, commercialize or monetize the data that you guys were collecting from people? So, because people are putting in their eating habits and, Mm -hmm. you know, relative to all their metrics or their macro data. Yeah, you know, data is important. We know it's a data world. Was that something that you guys were able to tap into or? Um, We we didn't tap into it for any other benefit than our own. Like I know a lot of businesses in this space have gone on to do amazing exits based on selling data i'm pretty sure sam would might have i think he sold uh, on based on data alone uh know. the he sold yeah i'm pretty sure he sold his app the 28 yeah sam 28 28 sam 28, 28 sam. by sam yeah 28 i think that sam. was i think that was a big driver in that sale the was da- the data yeah, right. that was collected and probably yeah. for whoever sells equolution as a whole like potentially down the line but for us we only ever used data really just to drive decision making like what do people like to eat what do we show more of and then I think down the line I've been out of the business now for two years but down the line as AI comes into the equation I mean they'd be mad not to say you liked tacos so you're probably going to like the nacho bowl as well you know something like that I think that's probably how that will develop over time yeah 100% so you and your business partner um, you know obviously you've you've got out of it now yeah but what does you know I guess getting close to you know that move that exit whatever that looks like is that is that the prize was that always the prize or no. does someone tap you on the shoulder you know what does that look like it i i don't think either of us had i remember one day we had um a coaching lesson with someone that was really big in the industry like a really big name he came in and exit was the first thing that he said sort of just to align the founders right what's your exit plan we're like oh my god anywhere Mm -hmm. we are not going anywhere you know and it was never really you know top of mind it was never the end goal or anything like that Um, but I think when you start a business hugely passionate at 22 you don't really account for 
how you're going to change, how your life will change, how your wants and needs will change over time. And it just so happened that mine changed in a direction that wasn't the same as 22 year old me, you know, how it really came about for me was I got to, firstly, it was a great business. So I I don't think there was any fear of like leaving with nothing or anything along those lines. I think it was always going to be a commercial opportunity. But I got to 29, I was living by myself. Um, I hadn't had a partner since I was like 23 and, or serious one at that, that matter. But um, I was really, if I was honest with myself, super lonely. Like I was just, I was really, really lonely. I felt empty. I'd missed a lot of family things. And it's so funny because we, I had my Nana's 80th birthday on the weekend and I was there with my now fiance and he was like, it's funny, you're not in heaps of photos. And I said, I missed heaps. I missed a lot, you know, yeah. there's heaps of family pics and I just wasn't in a lot of them, birthdays and, and stuff like that because there was a time when I was willing to give all of that up for my business and that served so well. But then it got to a point and this was the point, like 29 pre-exit, I was just like, I don't want to do it anymore. You know, I'm not happy. Why did, why, why are we doing all this? What for? For the check? Like, and that's what it felt like. It felt like I was the branding and marketing side of the business and um, very like community orientated and, and customer driven. And you've got to be really passionate about what you're doing to be able to be that vehicle in the business. And I kind of got to a point where even from a, um, a body perspective and stuff like I was kind of happy with where I was and I'm not really counting my cows and macros and I don't really want to talk about it anymore (laughs) like you know what I mean (laughs) so so that's where I was at I was 29 I lost my passion and even now I'm healthy health conscious fit but I'm not do or die like I was you know so I've changed and evolved and then there was the the personal side of things where I thought this is 29 this is where decisions need to be made you know, I've got to think about future hubby, future kids, you know, I'm, I know I hadn't thought about any of that at that point. And that's when I, when I stopped, I realized I was not, not entirely fulfilled. Yeah, that's full on. So yeah, you were at your best when you were actually, you were in the game and you were your customer, Yeah. essentially. So the yep. fact that, you know, you were young, looking, nothing to lose, no, yeah. nothing to lose, you know, maybe conscious of the figure, yep. doing all these things that maybe your customers are doing. Yeah. And that's probably the reason that it was so successful and um, you know, it went to the heights it did, but then you're saying that, there was yeah, you changed a bit and you, yeah. you know, um, yeah. and, and you'd sort of moved on a little bit, which, and which even, then maybe meant it was the right time. Exactly. And even business itself, like I had created a, a with my co-founder, a hugely successful business. And then I started becoming so passionate about other businesses and I started helping people free, like just not nothing, yeah, no, yeah. no proper engagement or anything. Um, started doing more podcasts. I've done dozens and dozens in my time loved talking about it but I wasn't talking about nutrition and what I'm eating in a day and what's on my plate or anything like that I loved business at that point and that's when I'd realized what I'd fallen out of love with and what I'd fallen in love with and that also enlightened that pivot as well can I ask yeah you you mentioned earlier that you you know you always had these little side hustles and you've got so much going on at the moment was it at that time that you were just solely doing yeah. ju- just that business. Yep. That's a really good point too because uh, it was then that I'd realized all my eggs were in one basket yeah. and a lot of great business people that I'm inspired by uh, were smart with that sort of diversifying sort of thing. Mm. And I'd realized like at this point, I was like 29, you know, we'd made all this money. I hadn't bought myself my first property yet. I had it just, I forgot about me basically. That was it in summary. And I sort of did, I think there's 24 hours in a day. If you can't do a couple of things, you know, that I think you can basically. Mm. And I believed that. And um, I think that's what keeps you passionate and alive as well is if you, you're you not hammering, you're just flogging one horse. Like it's, um you know, you're, you're well spread. And I think that that's what I was seeking. Yeah. So did, did it come after the exit, your, your passion to get into multiple fields yep. and multiple, yeah. Yeah. And it was just kind of by just kind of having my wits about me. Obviously an exit's not a clean break either. Like it's long, it's over a period of time, can be a bit messy and things like that. And I think I was faced with the reality of like, this doesn't pull off. I've just put all these eggs in this basket for eight years and, you know, I might need to start again. Like those thoughts came into um, 
my world and I think it's just made me a little bit more realistic for the future in terms of just be- reducing risk a little bit, mitigating that risk. With the, uh, with the exit, if we can talk about that. Sure. You know, like I think like you're alluding to, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. There's probably lawyers and accountants yep. and all those sorts of people. You know, what's 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 that like? Like what's that like when you make that decision? Do and, and did you make that um, jointly, obviously, mm-hmm. with, with your with your partner, um, your business partner? Yep. You know, both agreed at the same time, was it the right time for her as well? Yeah. And then and then what are the steps that lead up to that to that um, transaction? Well, when I was feeling as though things weren't what they were when we were 22, between us, within myself, you know, um, the dynamic, everything, you know, decision making, when things get bigger, the decisions get harder and all that kind of stuff. I, we mutually decided that I would take some leave. So I just ended up taking all of my leave. And it was then that we pretty much decided that this is the way that things were going to go based on the fact that Amal still had a job to do she felt and I felt like my job had been done so we sort of came together I actually left before I knew the valuation what I was looking at and everything so you know when people say like oh was it like the smart thing to do at the time nope like it was the highest risk thing probably the highest risk decision I've ever made because I I didn't really know what was on the other side and I was willing to give it all up because I thought that there was a better life on the other side of this both fulfillment wise and that's so powerful and commercially as well like yeah. so it I, wasn't even this big carrot going no. okay i'll go for no. that no i left before you I were going it's anyway it's like intuition that you yeah. just felt like there was something else over out there definitely and that's really difficult because most people like you again for fear are just going to keep turning yeah. up keep built going, built, oh, of, built of oh, eight yeah. years <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and um i had another app idea which i'm doing at the moment <laughs> um and i just i just felt it i was like this is the way I needed to go, you know, like I just felt that this was it. And if I had to start again, well, I started over once, like, yeah. you know, I quit Google. Started. It it's can't just be the, harder than the first yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. So I just, I, I don't know, I think it's like probably a bit of self-awareness and also self-belief too. But yeah, basically I didn't know the valuation. I didn't know anything. And then that's when the process began. So we started with evaluation. Everything was emotional. Like yeah, everyone yeah. would say in this position, take the emotion out of it. And if I could re-give advice, I, that's obviously where I would go. But Is that easier said than done? Do definitely, yeah. definitely. It's so emotional. Like even the valuation, like I, you know, don't come from a family like with a lot of money or anything like that. And it was just like, it just felt like eight years, like all summed up and I was so proud. But then also it was the end of an era and then it was exciting and then it was like a bit scary. And then it was just so many, so many things. So we got the valuation first. And, and sorry to cut you off, but is, yeah. is your business partner still in it? She's, she's still she's in it. She's staying around. Yeah. Yep. She moved into CEO straight away. Yeah. So like literally the week after I left, like yeah, she gotcha. moved into a CEO position yeah. and I still remained a director. And so jointly we decided on the big things and had like board meetings and things like that. But overall she was running the day to day and I was, we were facilitating my exit in the background because as much as it's not really her problem that I'm leaving it really is because the future of the business is in whoever steps but steps in so mm. it was really a joint kind of effort in this regard so we got the valuation that's going to be life-changing but it wasn't as easy as like I think when I got that I thought that's what I'm getting tomorrow that- <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not tomorrow do, do you need my details <laughs> the, nar- the narrator yeah. three years later <laughs> three years later yeah were well, you did you guys agree on the valuation or was it yep yep I agree. That's the valuation. Yeah, but I didn't care. Yeah, yeah I honestly yeah. did not care. And and you didn't even. I know that have sounds a so, so great. I know that sounds so bad. <laughs> yeah, so bad. But like at this time, mind you, this is the timeline. I've taken my leave in May, um, all the way to August. Yes. August comes round. Am I stepping back in? Am I going out? I end up resigning. I've decided I'm out. We start selling my shares. In November, I meet the love of my life. Like my whole life was changing outside of this business. You know, like yeah. everything, all the reasons why I wanted to leave, they all came started, straight away. came straight away. <laughs> like my, even the, the being able to go to family, I was just, I felt free again. So the price tag for that was whatever I was going to get or not going to get, you know, and I was yeah. fine. I was fine with that. I know it sounds like commercial, commercial people could hear this and be like, what a fucking fool. <laughs> 
But not at all, because life's about fulfillment, right? It it's not. A, it's not about zeros and yeah. numbers and shit. Because you know, one thing, and I've learned this recently, like time it comes to the end. It so to, true. You know, yeah. So you, you you can't. You don't get more time. You yeah. get more money. You can go and create another app, which sounds yeah. like you're doing. Yeah. And you can go and find other businesses, and but you just can't get your time back, man. Yeah. You can only be 29 once, going into your 30s and stuff. Yeah, I reckon it's epic and it's great, great uh, uh, story to share it's with everyone of, at home. Feels like Jade's been true to herself, hundred percent, rather than the not the money, the paycheck, not, not nothing other than just following your heart and taking and taking risk, being prepared to to like you said, lose it all to be true to your heart. Yeah, which is the exception, not the rule for most people, and that's why we're here, right? We're trying to tell those stories to try and cut through the lenses to get people out there that might be having those same conversations. Jay trying to get out of the cubicle or, or from behind the hoarding or whatever it is that they're trying to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And it's just, it's a matter of, it sounds like it's just, you just got to... Self-belief in, belief, as yeah. well. And I think, I think a lot of self-belief and self-confidence, people often ask me this, like, how did you know you would go? Or how do you think that you can go on and do X, Y, Z? And the truth is you sort of don't, but I think in life you're presented with a lot of opportunities to make promises to yourself. And if you can keep them and the more that they produce in a result format, the more you back yourself, you know? So like, for example, I just set the goals small. Like I left Equolution, I aimed to um, match my salary the next week. Like just go match the salary. And I ended up getting like a really, a a temp contract at a a big nutrition brand, match my salary there, then started consulting. Then was able, you know what I mean? So it was just like, Mm. just set the goals small. And the more you tick it, the more you just feel like, world's your oyster like and i really that think momentum. that creates momentum yeah, definitely yeah. definitely so it's not about yeah. like how am i going to go create the next evolution it's just like how what was the next step yeah and you don't have to know every yeah exactly you don't have to know how you're going to get there yeah. you just need to know you're going exactly. and take the next step yeah what yeah. um so let's go back three years what the hell, was, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> oh, like if everyone even. was if everyone yeah. sort of was in agreement they didn't and, agree and you just want to leave man the number's the number you know what i mean let's just do it i'm off Look, without getting into too much, I feel, whatever you're comfortable to say. I feel as though we don't. You just turn off. Everything. It's just not as simple as what you think. So, it's a different landscape and environment to perhaps what like VC was years ago. We learnt throughout the process, like where people used to just write blank checks. Basically, it's it's a lot harder, especially we're talking COVID period too. Yeah. So this is like post COVID. This is where you know people tightening their belts. This is where We've got, you know, wars that are impacting the economy and, and people being told that we've got a recession coming in and things like that. So it was just an unusual time. Um, we also had an incident of fraud as well where someone um, went through the entire due diligence process. We exchanged subscription terms and everything like that and then it fell through the night before they were meant to pay. Right. So that was good. That was fun. <laughs> That was like, it, but all the all the while, it wasn't necessarily about like the money hitting my account. It was like just shut the yes. chapter, Move you know. On, yeah. That was that was the strain for me personally. So you so you were getting an investor to buy in and buy into the business, and then your business partner was going to stay on as yep, a, correct. Stay on as a shareholder, yeah, and that's CEO director. But you're bringing in private yep. equity or yeah, whoever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then so we had one instance where it fell through and that was a that was like pretty much six months down the drain yeah well, maybe yeah. like six yeah six to eight months down the drain yeah yeah that's crazy and what do you do you, do you know what happened there like were they was it fraud as in they were trying to rip you off or was it um, it was they were they were misled by an external pump party that they were getting the right. money from so oh. they basically just lied yeah 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 <laughs> we've got the money they but don't have don't the money. Have money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that was one instance. Yeah, yeah. that costs yeah. a lot of time. That's yeah. so. That's the thing too. Like once you, once you enter these agreements, you you sign on exclusive. They've got exclusive rights at that yeah. point in time. So it's not like you can go hustling for a backup option or anything like that either. Yeah, and have all the ducks in a row if that so one if, fails. So if anything falls through, you, it just costs you time. Back and to it's, start again. And it's yeah. not a week or two. No, it's that's months. right. Slow moving. Yeah. Slow moving beast. Yeah. Um. So that's happened recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Which is cool. Which is cool. Yeah. Um, that was very exciting. That would, that congratulations. Would, thank you. Three years. Yeah, three congratulations. Years. Yeah. You finally turned that You chapter. seem yeah, free. Literally. You seem free. <laughs> I yeah. feel it. You seem happy. And I'm really happy. Yeah. 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 I got engaged. 
Congratulations. The, Congratulations. I think it was the week that I found out weird. I know he did well, didn't he? <laughs> didn't he? Yeah. Oh, I have seen, seen he? that. Yeah. He crossed your arms a couple of times. Did, I've been looking at it. Did he use all the settlement money? For that? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, no, he did really well. No, he did great. <laughs> yeah. that. Did really yeah. well. I hope my wife's not watching this. Hey, um, no, you go, PK. You go. Um, that's, yeah, that's super incredible. Like, congratulations on the Thank settlement. You. Three long, arduous years. Yeah. You're true to yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, you found love of your life, yeah. engaged, probably wedding at some point. Yes. Um, it's exciting. And now you're off doing another app. I am. So is yes. that still under wraps? Yeah. It No. So basically, in summary, after Equolution, I privately consulted for a little while. And then I met a girl who was doing the same and we started an agency I did that agency for 18 months and then on the other side of that sort of realized that I didn't love the agency model. We were doing technology and marketing. So um, pretty much like we needed a big team to execute exactly what it is that we were offering. Um, But I personally loved like the one-on-one service and my cohort and like the businesses that I was attracting started to change landscape too. So it used to be, you know, small, small businesses that just wanted to like get up and running or, you know, crack the seven figure mark and now that they're, they're starting to look a little bit more like high tier and that's more interesting for me um from that perspective so they started coming my way so I decided to break out and um I started Spoon Adventures and Advisory so that was with the goal of hopefully acquiring equity in some of these businesses doing like mm. cash cash equity split and having the opportunity to invest when the settlement came through and whatnot. And even before that, I, I did a couple of little ones. Um, but yeah, so invest in the future and whatnot. So that's how that came about um, on my own. And that was all like a learning experience too, because, you know, when I left Equolution, I felt like I couldn't do the next best thing without a business partner. And then I sort of gained strength on my own to realize that I can wear all of the hats whereas before I only wore a couple and um, so that's how that came about and then in the background a lot of the clients that I'm servicing need the product that I'm developing so it was sort of like market research it was cool amazing and then it gives you the opportunity to diversify yeah. which you were saying earlier exactly and, and then get to know the people and sort of buy into them and yeah. say i want to be in business with you exactly exactly and a lot of the, the clients that i've had have been with me for like over 12 months so you're kind of doing a lot of behind the scenes dd at that point you yeah. know you know them really well you work together well it's collaborative it's a good partnership and they're sort of like the investments that i want to make yeah yeah amazing so amazing now, story pk i just had a question that i need to get off about uh about the just going back to the original app and yeah. and, and acquiring customers, um, just always been interested about like um, the the lifetime average at the start. Yep. So I imagine when the app was like an MVP and mm-hmm. you said it took three times and, and that UX was a big part of what it was a, a success, which that would have taken time. That would have taken time to evolve. Mm-hmm. So can you talk to us about like yeah the the lifetime how how long people were staying into the app. In the uh, uh-huh. initial, because I'd imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, in the beginning you were just trying to get them in, right? And Definitely. then we weren't necessarily thinking about how you were going to retain them. Yep. So can you talk about that sort of little bit of evolution? Because sure. it's always been fascinating to see that if you can get them in quick enough to be able to retain them, to be able to, you've got to yep. move it. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a bit of a tricky conundrum trying to move quick enough and keeping them retained. Definitely. Well, I think the first place to start is the importance of having like a quality product or service so we were getting results so that was the first thing like if our thing you know that we were offering to the market didn't work for the market we'd have a really big problem so that i think is like that's a black and white yeah Yeah. that is just like does your thing work and does it work well and does it stand out from the crowd and we were yes 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 to all of those questions and then the second thing was listening to what customers were willing to pay what they could afford to pay how much was realistic for them to pay to stay on. And this is where our price kind of influenced the lifetime value because we were probably not budget friendly at the beginning. So because it was such a manual service and we were doing all of this, you know, individually per client with with an individual coach, we factored that into the pricing and it was $75 a week for a membership. And now to give some perspective of how that's evolved. The premium op- option with the coach is like 50 bucks a week and the standard version, which is access to the app alone, is like 50 bucks a month. Yeah. So that's how much it's changed sort of like over time. 
And Got to remember, people are paying for gym memberships as well on top of that. So yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it is very much complimentary. Because so, it's, it's a complimentary, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. and we weren't providing training. So that's something that we've got to be mindful of too because in this space, um, a lot of the big competitors do nutrition and training. Equolution mm-hmm. is just diet. So that's something to be mindful of as well. If you're you know, up against someone that's doing both, if you're not attainable price-wise, you could lose them just through the person that has that extra so better bang for their buck basically mm-hmm. so that happened and then the other thing that happened was that we were losing people obviously finding this out through exit surveys um we were losing people through um uh they just wanted access to the app but they didn't necessarily need the coach either so that's sort of a testament to the customer journey and what happens in a weight loss journey like you need a handhold at the beginning but mm-hmm. you might not need that person every like, week yeah you yeah. get someone to get you on track and then you can yep. yeah so that's how the standard and the premium option came about was premium was do you need you know the the one on one coach and then standard was do you just love our application and that and that helped uh, increase retention or or lifetime yeah. life uh, yeah how how long they were customers for exactly because what what would the average be like cuz i imagine is there many that go on that, that, that would go into something like this and then they stay on it for years yeah. or is it more of a eight month sort of thing? Like how, how quickly do you need to sort of find new customers to keep it sort of growing? Cause well, pretty quick at the beginning because it was minimum commitment term was eight weeks um, right. and we found that people were staying for about 16, but that just means that like three times a year we've got to go and find, you know, new customers to satisfy the same numbers that we were servicing sort of thing. So it was high churn. And to be honest with you, we weren't, we weren't really confirmed confronted with the churn rate until we started to look at our metrics properly for the valuation and the the exit. So we were pretty disconnected from that. We would only ever act on, I guess, the feedback side of the reason for leaving, like because we processed all of that and we got that information, we would be like, why are they leaving? Um, But we weren't necessarily focused on, okay, so as business, we've lost X, we've got to get Y type thing as much as when I left. Like I would say before um, pre exit sort of thing um maybe that first five years was just such a uh, uh, it was building. just such a building, building. yeah, yeah. We and under, me and pete understand I yeah think we're, we're sort of going through that or yeah. we're coming out of that i reckon you're just trying to do the best you can at the time exactly keep, keep all the balls happy. in the air and if you had the time to go and look at the data yeah. at that length you, totally. you probably would have and yeah. then you get to like sort of five years plus and then it's sort of like you know to be honest with you we got a we got a really great accountant um probably year six or something. Me personally, that was the first time I'd ever looked at a P&L statement. <laughs> <laughs> truthfully. And that's like the bread and butter of what I, better t- than me. <laughs> what I tell my clients now, but like truthfully, that was like my experience was yeah. like, and also I know this sounds like a little bit, I guess, arrogant in a way, but when you're doing super well, you don't really need to go that granular. I know that yeah. sounds like ignorant, but yeah. No, but no, I think, I think you're spot on. Like yeah. we, we, we look at the P&Ls and, you definitely look at them more when you think, oh, you know, it's been quite quiet, quiet yeah. quarter yeah. or something like that or what can we dial or what can we cut or, or you know, whatever those things are. But when you're in that good quarter, you know, you it's just, like it just sits over there and I know it's yeah. all right. Well, you, you it's dialed fine. into what you're doing, right? That's driving that, yeah. that's driving that revenue. So. Yeah. yeah. Even when I was – but even the expenditure too, like when I was exiting and, you know, we were presenting these numbers to investors and stuff, I was like, come on, we could have – we could have reined that in a little bit better, you know. So I definitely recommend it now. But yeah, I think um, getting granular about the data is super important. But it wasn't. It was that that, that was a matured approach. I think to running the business yeah. wasn't yeah. that first five six years at all. Yeah. For, for the next moves, Jade, are you staying in similar sort of industry like yeah. the health and wellness stuff? Or I know you're getting into the app and different business the partners. Data. I am. I know it's a secret, but I, I'm sure she'll share something. Oh, it's not. It's not a. <laughs> I mean, it's not a massive secret. I'm happy to share a little bit about what I'm doing, but I am creating a business management software for online coaches and personal trainers. Yeah, mint. So it's yeah, essentially mint. taking like a, a lot of what I understand about the customer and creating a really good experience for their end user yeah. um, and sort of allowing them to, to manage their business super well as well. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Yeah, so there's a lot of off-the-shelf Bruce solutions. Wants in. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of um, off-the-shelf solutions at the moment that you can sort of white label and whatnot. They just so such as Monday and stuff. Is that what you, you mean? You know what? It's so, what you're saying is bang on because like your Monday.coms, your Asanas, and all that kind of stuff Asana, is yep. like business management, yep. and then their customers are being serviced through like your trainerize, 
you know, there's a couple of other ones, Kahuna's, Everfit, etc. But there's not. Right, but there's not, but there's not a yeah. So so you've kind of figured out what consumer wants. Consumer wants coach needs. Yeah, yeah. and and you're just going to play that that yep. middleman almost, so they can start plugging in consumer yep. receives, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Because I mean, I've had personal training coaches in the past, and you know, they all have something different and their own little yeah. process or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, if you can make uh, an end user platform yep. that's comfortable to use, and you want to wake up and check what you're having for breakfast yes. every day, yeah, like what you said, make yeah. it sticky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. So yeah, just like that, all in one. Exciting. Could yeah, I, could very I ask a question that we like to ask our guests that yes. have had an exit yes. I like to ask them <laughs> yes. was there uh, leading into over you had plenty of time to think about it over three years was <laughs> there was there something that you were was there a special purchase you know that you you wanted to buy yourself not necessarily an expensive thing but something that you know that commemorated that you you, you know you were proud of and you Sorry, oh, I feel business? like I'm going to get emotional. It was... Oh, my gosh. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, Benny. No, no, because I only know because I still haven't figured out mine. But one day, <laughs> I'm that kind of guy where I would... Yeah, I would... It wouldn't be a Lamborghini or anything like that, but it would be something special that I would always have, yeah. I don't want to get emotional. <laughs> it was to give my dad a check. Oh, oh <laughs> Sorry. <that's amazing. laughs> that is so cool. It was always, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Sorry. And that's the, and that's I've the, never yeah. cried on a podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you guys have me in a good time. It's post-exit. It's where the yeah. emotions, yeah. No, it yeah. was always, it was always well, my dad. Well, it's, it's a massive thing to yeah. achieve. Like yeah. you were a young, young girl and, and, and you, you said earlier that you didn't come from a place of money or, yeah. or influ- you know, whether you had people influencing you or whatever. So you've, you've done it from the ground up and, yeah. and you're still only young now and you're running around with an equity fund. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. Anyone that's got a bloody equity fund. You know? So yeah, so yeah, you should be proud. But yeah, I've, I've always, that's always where I go because money, you can only spend so much of it. Yeah. Right? Once I think we had Simon Beard on who's you know, billionaire yeah, or yeah. close enough. Like he, he's, he's explained it pretty clear that once you get a, a certain amount of money and you buy these things, they have a certain amount of yeah. gratification, but it's not, you know, and then eventually it's, 100%. you get conditioned. So it's about, it's really about that deeper meaning, isn't it? Yeah, and what, totally. Yeah. And do you know what, even from a financial standpoint, like I changed a lot through my exit too. So mind you, like I had this great business and then I kind of had nothing like from after, like when I, when I left, like I didn't have, access to those resources anymore all my money was kind of tied up in that business and my wealth was tied up in that business I'd lost my salary so I pretty much toned my entire lifestyle right down and that's when I got really I guess granular with how I feel towards materialistic things and I was look I still like nice things I mean it's no secret I, my jewelry's lovely, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but you I know your partner likes nice. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, but yeah, like I, I definitely have my pieces that I, I love, and um, I'm happy to spend money on. But everything else got really stripped back for me, and the unnecessary spending and being lavish and being like uncomfortably over the top was definitely a phase. And I think a yeah. lot of business owners go through something very similar. You know, when like you know, when you can't wait for the next thing you're going to buy. But then there comes a point in time where like that next thing I'm going to buy became more the next thing I was going to do. And it, it sort of changed landscape for me. And I'm really, you know, as much as I begrudged the process of going through a three-year exit because it's been horrific, like if I'm completely honest with you, like sleepless nights, stress, um, anxiety, like all the rest, like it's been really – horrible and time consuming and financially consuming as well with all of the lawyers fees and whatnot I'm so glad that it happened to the post three year having exited version of me than me when I just left because the respect that I have for money now is not what I had when I left that business at all it's it's Mm. like definitely newfound so even in terms of like the things I was going to do when it was when it was over, they just seem so different to what I would have probably done with that money, you know. Yeah. And even the things, the the significant things that I'm doing, buying, etc., um, they're not for me, you know. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm buying my partner a Rolex, like for our wedding, wedding present, and like does he know that? You know, my, um, yeah, he does. He, knows. <laughs> <laughs> he does. Which um, one? Which one? Which one? Oh, I don't know yet. We're oh, gonna okay. we're gonna go to Europe in July, and I feel like they've got a like bloody smorgasbord over there, yeah, much yeah. better than here. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, just like, it's just different. It's just so different. Like, I want to take my whole family on a holiday, yeah. you know, all of catch us up, together. Catch up on some of those things. Yeah. yeah. So, it's different now. Mm. That's amazing. 
That's amazing. And yeah, writing your data check must have been... Yeah, I'm sorry know, I had got a bit too... I've no, never cried right. on a podcast <laughs> ever. It's because it's so fresh. No, yeah, I yeah. I can appreciate that as well. My parents didn't come much money yeah. either. And I think most people would... You know, that's... that's that's, My the dad's whole, a, that's the holy grail, isn't it? To exactly. be able to hand something over and give what something you, back to your parents. What influence did your dad have, have over you? So a lot because – so my dad had a real estate agency when <laughs> I was growing up and he did super well and he, um, he sort of did something really similar to me. He sort of got to a point in his life and all the things that he once loved, he didn't love anymore and that was – real estate included that was his marriage wasn't fulfilling him anymore and he literally left with nothing but just wasn't quite able to rebuild um and I think that was always I I've definitely been influenced by that you know by that almost like a fear of losing everything but then working so hard that that doesn't happen sort of thing and Mm. um even so like my dad is so much happier now than when from the outside in he looked like he had it all together he had um after he got divorced and whatnot he had a heart attack and he actually died on the the lounge room floor and they they brought him back um with the what do they call them defib yeah the def yep um and he was been a completely different person since like soft couldn't give a rat's ass about you know the money in his back pocket etc given a sort of little second chance yeah exactly exactly so i think he's just i don't know he's always taught me kindness and I think that was really important. Um, he's a postie now. He's like in his 60s and he walks like 16 kilometers a day and stuff. And I just, it was, it's nice to reward someone that works so hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no, yeah, awesome. big influence. And my mum is an um, amazing business person, just like downright hustler. Like she, <laughs> after her and dad split, she got the divorce money and went and started a business. Um, that was actually like a cool story because she, she started a cocktail, um, slushy business, the hire, hire company. She used to do, um, B2C for a lot of years. So she would hire these um, machines out, sort of like, yeah, yeah. like 250 a pop type thing, go collect the machine, wash it, then, you know, um, uh, rehire it and whatnot. And then about four years ago, she landed like four massive contracts with like the Lyric and the Capital Theatre and after 15 years in business, the whole trajectory of her, like everything just changed. Like, yeah. you know, she, yeah, she's been able to do things that she, I've never known her to be able to do. So she was, that yeah, I've got good influence. Runs good in influence. the family. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Jade, this has been awesome. We've got Thank a question you. that we ask, which I'm sort of interested to hear this. Yeah, this, yeah. Will be, this will be good. Which is sort of up your alley because... This is what you do, but yeah. it's our ten thousand dollar question. So, if oh. you had ten thousand dollars to start a business right now, what industry would you choose, and how would you spend the money to build your business? Guys, ten thousand is not a lot. No, we keep not. hearing that. We keep. Yeah, hearing I know. But remember, we're, to, we're I'm we're in technology. To... <laughs> <laughs> I'm creating an app or a software, maybe and no, ten grand's not going to get. Maybe it's ten thousand for the business plan and, and what it's going to be about. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, ten thousand is the rule. You got to start with nothing. You know what? I'm Pete? starting with. Don't get uh, get resourceful. Not. Oh, I can't remember this. Okay. <laughs> I've got 10 grand. I'm going to bank that. And I'm, the Ooh. first thing I'm going to do is find an equity partner that is in technology. So I'm going to give up 40% to a potential CTO. Um, and he's going to be a coder and a software developer. And I'm going to create an application that is sort of like Canva cross chat GPT. And you pump in what you want to create in terms of a graphic and it spits out the graphic for you. So you put your branding, logo so, and stuff. So, 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 so prompting. Graphics. Sounds pretty yeah, good graphic, for university. Graphic prompting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want um, one slide with this photo and this logo that says um, 25% off all shred programs something and you can drop reference images. Yeah. And it maybe spits a out URLs graphic. or something. Yeah. And yeah. your color palette and everything. It yeah. spits that out. How good's that? So Jade's got the business partner in, got AI, the, got the and equity split. And I've saved 10 split, grand. And the yeah, 10 yeah. grand still sitting <laughs> in the back. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Talk about getting resourceful. Yeah. No, see... Resourceful? This, What's that? What is that quote? I can't remember. See, when Don't you... Get, I've asked you for more money to see if you'd put it up, but you didn't, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. And, <laughs> and now that, we've missed out. <laughs> and the moral is you get resourceful and that's what you did, right? Like, it's not about the money, it's about figuring it out. And exactly. you've got to get resourceful. Find somewhere else with the money. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, Jade. Well done. And like we said, congratulations yeah. on such a great Thank story you. and a grind and, and even sort of um, 
yeah, like finding. Thanks for being the first trio to to get the waterworks going on. Pop, <laughs> get the waterworks. Question, Betty. Hey? I'm just clip it, clip I can't it, Bonnie. Believe that. Yeah. Is that the title of this podcast? Might be the hook. She, she fucking <laughs> business cried. Business savage <laughs> cries. She fucking cried in lowercase, <laughs> all just lowercase. Yeah, she. Uh, Bonnie will be able to edit the tears on. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was cool. That was yeah, Thank fascinating. You. That was real. Yeah, well thanks done. for having me. Thank you. <laughs> well done, really good, Jade. Yeah, please, guys, remember a dollar in twenty twenty four donating to our amazing charity Epidemolus Belosa. EB, EB, the worst disease you've never heard of. Uh, and if you want to make a bigger splash, littlefishpodcast.com.au. See you at the top. You. People want to be part of a winning team. People can find a better version of themselves if they choose. Hmm. You just need to go start some shit. Action is all that matters. Be a man of your word. I think I look back now and I'm like, whoa, that took some guts. Be kind. Be kind. Be kind. See you at the top. New episode every Wednesday.